Hello and welcome everybody to the 28th Inspiration Exchange session and thank you for joining us um, today. Today's session is going to be a part two of our AI Stats and iClear showcase where several members of the lab are going to give short teaser presentations uh, introducing their, their, their recent work presented at these two fantastic conferences. So today, um, in today's session, we have four, uh, four presentations. The first will be by our PhD student, Alicia Kurth, who will be presenting on heterogeneous treatment effects in the time to event setting with competing risks. We'll then have Alan Jeffries, who will give a presentation on neural network regularization um, via latent neural attributions. Uh, Yucha Quinn uh, will then present on temporal clustering. And finally, Boris Van Bruegel will present on membership inference attacks. If you have any questions for any of uh, today's speakers, please do post questions in the Inspiration Exchange channel on our Slack, um, which will be posted in the chat now. Uh, without any further ado, Alicia, would you like to kick us off with your presentation? Well, hello everyone, thanks for joining. Um, I'll be presenting our paper on understanding the impact of competing events on heterogeneous treatment effect estimation from time to event data today, which we presented at AI Stats earlier this year. Um, this is quite a handful uh, of concepts for a single title. Um, so let's just start by jumping right into understanding the setting that we're considering. Uh, we're interested in a setting where we want to make personalized predictions for individuals that are characterized by some covariates X, um, and we're interested in a time to event setting. Um, that is, we have some kind of main event of interest uh, in our, we will be using the example of a cancer event, um, where we're interested uh, whether a cancer related event is going to occur to this patient. Um, so here, Y uh, indicates whether um, a cancer event such as um, tumor size exceeding a certain threshold has occurred by a certain time step T. Basically, we're just considering whether an event has occurred. Um, in this context, we're interested in the effect of a binary treatment, so basically an intervention that can either be given or not given to a patient. Um, and so that's kind of the ma major setting that we're interested in. Um, if we were, if this was it, um, this is actually kind of a simple survival analysis treatment effect estimation problem. Uh, we've done that a couple of years ago. Um, so what we're actually interested in is making it a little bit more complicated and a little bit more real. Um, because often in reality, there's not only one event that can happen to a patient, but that there can be multiple um, so-called competing events. Basically, these are other events um, that can occur and um, stop the actual event from happening. So in this case, we're considering a setting where we also have cardiovascular events. So for example, let's say a heart attack. Um, and if a patient dies with a heart attack, that means they can no longer have the cancer event, obviously. Um, so basically, conceptually, this means if a, my patient had a cardiovascular or competing event um, at this point in time, it means we can no longer observe anything that happens after that point in time. Now, in this context, we're now interested in how do we actually estimate treatment effects? if there's not only our main event that we're interested in, but also a competing event. Um, what we might be um, inclined to do is to just use our standard treatment effect estimation toolbox, uh, where the most simple approach of estimating heterogeneous effects is kind of this idea of comparing potential outcome predictions. That is, if we have an estimate um, of the risk of the main event occurring by the end of study without a treatment, um, and an estimate of the risk of main event occurring by the end of treatment with the treatment, um, then we can simply compare them um, and use that as our treatment effect estimates, and that's called a t-learner um, in the general setting. Now, to see, we can do this, and it is possible, but it can sometimes lead to kind of un unexpected conclusions. So consider we have a patient, um, a group of patients that's characterized by some covariates values, um, and in the control group, uh, we observe let's say half the people actually have the cancer event. Now in the treatment group, uh, we give everyone the treatment and everyone immediately dies of a heart attack, unfortunately. Um, but th that now kind of means that we only observe heart attacks. We no longer have any um, ca cancer events at all. So if we compute this quantity up there, what we get is that half the people in the control group um, have the cancer event, um, but no one in the treatment group actually has the cancer event. So what one could say, the treatment is actually very, very effective um, at preventing cancer, um, but not in the way that we possibly would have wanted to. So 
that that kind of shows that conceptually the treatment effect estimation problem in a competing event setting is actually pretty difficult. Um, and that is because competing events actually present a conceptual challenge. They're mediators of the effect of treatments um, on the outcome of interest. And you can see this here where um, our competing events D, um, they lie on the path of the treatment to um, the outcome of interest. And as is often the case in mediation settings, there's actually more than one effect of possible interest. The one that we've discussed um, originally is what's sometimes called a total effect. It answers the question, what is the total effect of treatments that can go through all paths, including the ones that go through the competing events? Um, this is relatively straightforward to identify. It requires the same identification assumptions as a standard treatment effect um, estimation setting, where we just need ignorability with respect to the treatment itself. Um, but has this conceptual challenge that it can lead to kind of counterintuitive conclusions on, on what makes the treatment effective. But if we're willing to kind of accept that, then it's very easy to estimate um, and can be estimated through cost specific predictions from time to event competing events models in like a T learner fashion. Um, a different type of effect that we could consider in this setting um, is what's called a direct effect, which answers the question what is the effect of treatment in a world where um, competing events just simply don't occur? This requires pretty strict um, identifying assumptions to be estimated from observational data and has a quite a strong conceptual challenge in that it requires us to imagine a world where a competing event cannot um, can be eliminated. So basically it requires a world in which cardiovascular events do not exist, which is quite far away from our own world, I think. But if we're willing to kind of um, rely on these assumptions, um, then we can estimate these effects um, by treating the competing event as a censoring mechanism and using a single um, time to event model um, in a T-learner fashion as before. A final effect that we could be interested in is what's called a separable direct effect. And that um, requires us to conceptually be able to change, the, uh, to decompose the treatment into part of the mechanism, which is kind of the treatment, how it actually should work. So the treatment's effect on the outcome of interest. And the second part is kind of a, is the mechanism that, that maybe causes toxicity um, and actually cause the um, competing events in the first place. A separable direct effect is then um, answers the question, what is the effect of the treatment component that acts only um, on Y? Um, and this to identify this, this requires also very strong assumptions um, on the uh, ignorability with respect to treatment and something called dismissible components. Um, conceptually, this simply requires treatment to be decomposable into two parts um, and can also be estimated from observational data, but not as a T-learner type byproduct of existing predictions, but it requires um, um, cost-specific hazard estimates. So all of these effects can um, be identified and estimated if we're willing to make um, the right assumptions, but there are still learning challenges associated with them. Um, in our paper, we study these different effects um, as treatment specific um, hazard estimation problems because they can be framed as a very standard machine learning classification problem. In particular, um, it's a classification setting where we simply ask of those at risk today who will experience their, risk, uh, their event today that can be solved through a loss function that looks something like this, which I will now not go into. The most important part here um, is that um, this at risk distribution captures the individuals who are still alive and have received a treatment. So this is an observational distribution. Um, and this actually causes covariate shift, which is the main learning challenge in this context, uh, because different effects conceptually correspond to different interventions, um, which lead to an adverse distribution that can differ quite substantially from the observational distribution. Um, a total effect requires only an intervention on the treatment itself, so there's only confounding induced shifts with respect to the total effect, uh, while a separable effect there's additional covariate shifts if treatments, if the treatment effect on the competing event itself is heterogeneous. And because the direct effect also requires complete elimination of the competing events, there are additional shifts here um, if the risk of the competing events depends on covariates. Now, in our paper, we theoretically analyze these effects um, in a kind of standard domain adaptation setup. Um, and then provide some empirical insights by looking at a simulation study where we check um, how different, how the estimates of different effects are differently affected in different settings uh, by different levels of covariate shifts. But overall, um, we've kind of answered the question of how much harder does the presence of competing events make the heterogeneous treatment effect um, estimation problem with quite a bit 
because competing events bring conceptual identification and estimation challenges. In terms of going forward, uh, we have to say that we focus on very simple covariate shift mitigation strategies in our paper, so we mainly looked at importance weighting. So there's actually lots more room for technical innovation here. Um, if you're interested in this, please do check out our paper for much more detail. And um, we are very grateful to AstraZeneca for um, support in this project. Thank you very much. So yeah, so I'll be presenting Tangos, which is uh, regularizing tabular neural networks through gradient orthogonalization and specialization. And this was joint work with Tennyson Liu and co-authors Jonathan Krabbe, Fergus Imri, and of course, Mihaila van der Schaar. So uh, despite being ubiquitous in practical applications, tabular data has been less impacted by deep learning than other modalities that have strong, consistent inductive biases, such as images or text. However, in recent years, there's been an explosion of work in, in applying deep learning methods to tabular style data within the research community. These deep learning methods often aim to improve performance over existing baselines, but others attempt to leverage distinct benefits of representation learning, including multimodal learning, meta-learning, semi-supervised learning, and certain interpretability methods. In this work, we propose a general purpose regularizer, just like wake decay or, or dropout, that aims to induce an inductive bias in deep neural networks that is well suited to the tabular setting. Specifically, as illustrated in these correlation plots, we consider the relationship between the neuron activations in the latent representation and the input features of a given example. We apply Tango's regularization to encourage these neurons to become specialized and orthogonal with respect to the input features throughout training. So Tangos encourages different neurons to attend to less overlapping subsets of input features, a suitable inductive bias for heterogeneous tabular data, resulting in better generalization performance. In the paper, we show that this behavior is unique and is not observed in neural networks trained with existing popular regularization methods. This is illustrated here, where we compare the gradients, the gradient attributions of 10 latent neurons with respect to the input features of an MNIST input example for models trained with and without Tango's regularization. The attributions of the Tango's model are specialized and orthogonal, each attending to specific and non-overlapping features relevant for discrimination between classes. In this case, it appears hidden neuron two, which I've circled in the slide, detects the top of the digit nine, which would of course be important for distinguishing between nines and fours. We then leverage ensemble theory to show that Tango's regularization results in more diversity among latent neurons, as displayed by the red line. This provides additional motivation for applying this regularizer in the tabular domain, an area where traditional ensemble methods have per performed particularly well. So how is Tango's regularization implemented? We define the gradient of latent neuron I with respect to input feature J as an attribution which captures how that neuron attends to each of the input features for a given example. Tango's regularization then consists of two terms added to the standard loss of the task in hand. The first of these promotes specialization by enforcing sparsity for each neuron's attributions using the L1 penalty. The second then promotes orthogonalization between the attributions of different neurons by penalizing the correlation between attributions for all possible pairs of neurons. These same expressions are also depicted visually on the, on, in the figure on the right. In practice, each of these terms is weighted by their own hyperparameter scalar term similar to weight decay. The penalty is then applied at a batch level with, sub, with a subsampling scheme applied to the orthogonalization term due to the exponential growth in possible pairings of neurons as the latent dimension grows. We evaluate tangos across 20 tabular data sets split evenly between regression and classification tasks. We, we begin by evaluating tangos as a standalone regularization method applied to a standard fully connected network. A ranking plot of each of the evaluated methods on each data set demonstrates that tangos, the dark green line generally ranks highly compared to other regularizers. In practice though, we typically use multiple regularizers in tandem. Together, therefore, 
We also evaluate the improvement in performance when tangos is paired with each of the baseline methods. Here, each color represents a different baseline where the shaded bars on the right display the loss with tangos also applied in tandem. Consistently across all regularization methods, being paired with tangos provides an additional boost in performance. To summarize, tangos is a, is a drop-in regularization method promoting specialization and orthogonalization among latent neurons targeted at specifically at tabular style tasks. Uh, check out the paper for more details and future directions, and also check out the code, which we've uh, shared on GitHub, uh, to integrate tangos into your own work or research. Thanks very much for your time. Okay, next I'm going to introduce our latest work on temporal phenotyping to discover predictive temporal patterns. This paper is accepted at ASDS 2023, and it is a joint work with my supervisor, Mihail van der Shah, and a former PhD student, Shang He Lin, of our lab. Before diving into the matter details, uh, a first question we may ask would be that, what are phenotypes and uh, why should I care about them? Generally speaking, phenotypes are annotations or patient subgroups of some shared attributes, like common characteristics in age and biomarkers or similar clinical outcomes in the future. The identification of patient phenotypes is very important in precision medicine since it enables knowledge extraction from noisy and high dimension healthcare data, allows actionable prognosis based on similar patients, and also provides insights to help clinicians issue tailored treatments to their patients. Okay, while disease phenotyping is essential for pre uh, precision medicine, there are <clears throat> two major challenges in its practical applications. First, there may exist some very complex interactions between patient features and their clinical outcomes. For example, the male score is widely used to evaluate the severity of liver disease. It is defined based on three major risk factors and is validated to be a strong predictor of patient mortality. However, the function form of the male score unavoidably leads to irregularly shaped patient subgroups in the feature space. Conventional methods like the Centray or k will certainly fail to correctly identify the associated phenotypes. In the meantime, for disease like cystic fibrosis, the temporal variation patterns in patient covariance are usually predictive of their patient's outcomes. Thus, the effective utilization of longitudinal data is that another challenge for disease subtyping. Particularly, unlike the tabular data in static settings, there's no standard way to evaluate the similarity between patient trajectories. The follow-ups of two patients may set at different disease stages, and the observation interval may not be fixed. And as in the meantime, the longitudinal, longitudinal records may also have very different lengths, which makes the direct comparison of patient trajectory infeasible in most uh, scenarios. To address these challenges, in this work, we propose our method T phenotype following a new paradigm of temporal phenotyping. Specifically, based on some predictive model G of some patient outcomes of our interest, we aim at finding phenotypes to capture the associations between predictive temporal patterns in the patient covariance and some typical clinical outcomes. This combines the two conventional paradigms of trajectory-oriented and outcome-oriented clustering and provides more refined and informative patient subgroups to clinicians. In the following, I will focus on discussing how we tackle the two major challenges of disease subtyping in our method. First, to capture complex interactions between patient characteristics and the clinical outcomes, we introduce a general definition of phenotype as a tuple described by a common clinical status V and a predictive pattern represented by a contiguous area phi in the feature space. This definition allows us to model patient subgroups of very complex shapes in the feature space. However, a given two patients, it will also make it more difficult to check 
whether or not they are of the same phenotype. To address this issue, we propose a novel path-based test to evaluate the phenotype similarity between any two patients. Essentially, it checks what to what extent our definition of phenotype could be validated if, if the two patients are put into the same subgroup. Then, given our definition about phenotype in the general case, our next question would be how to perform the path-based test on similarity for longitudinal data. First, let us recall the challenges. Longitudinal records in healthcare data size could be of variable length and irregular observation intervals. They may also have different starting points, leading to the issue of alignments and uh, length censoring, etc. Ideally, a unified representation space is de desired in order for us to perform the comparison between patient trajectories effectively. Inspired by the Laplace transform and the relationship between time and frequency domains, we introduce a novel Laplace encoder to create an embedded space that has our uh, desired property. Specifically, any patient trajectory could be represented by a fixed length Laplace embedded, which includes the pose and coefficients in its Laplace transform. We then show that the contiguity in such a Laplace domain of this embeddance can imply contiguity of patient trajectories in time domain. And this enables us to perform our aforementioned path-based test in the unified Laplace uh, domain instead. So I said we can address all of these challenges with longitudinal data collected from real-world scenarios. Then based on the two key contributions discussed above, we formulate the temporal phenotyping as a clustering problem and develop a phenotype discovery pipeline in our method. The time series data are first embedded into the Laplace domain and a predictor is trained to capture the global feature outcome interaction. Then we perform a pairwise pathways test and uh, test the similarity between all patients in the embedding space and uh, store the similarity result, uh, evaluation results in a similarity graph. And in the end, a graph constrained k means clustering approach is applied to find the major phenotypes uh, inside an observational data site. We demonstrate the advantage of our new uh, disease phenotyping approach with two real-world data sites on Alzheimer's disease and uh, SEO outcomes. The benchmark results show that our method outperform all baseline methods on phenotype discovery and has the best or close to the best uh, diagnosis accuracy. Further, we show with a case study from the ADNI data site that the phenotype annotations by our method are better aligned with the other underlying disease progression as reflected in temporal patterns in patient covariates. And this shows that our method also has a higher uh, prognosis value compared to the state-of-the-art temporal phenotyping approach, ACTVC. Finally, many thanks to the Cystic Fibrosis Trust for supporting this research. And we thank all co-authors for their contribution in this work. To take any questions um, we might have from the audience, I'm not sure if anybody has posted anything in Slack yet, but does anybody um, currently here who would like to ask um, any questions? If so, if I could ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question in maybe kind of 20 or 30 seconds um, to whichever one of the speakers um, Fantastic. Uh, Jean-Baptiste, um, why don't you unmute yourself and ask um, and ask your question? Thanks, uh, Fergus. Uh, many thanks, Yao, for the presentation. Um, would it be possible to have also explainability with uh, the um, temporal clustering that you present? Is it possible to identify uh, important uh, features to 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 explain the belonging to a, a given uh, cluster. 
is it uh, clear? My my question is is clear. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, do, do you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your question is very clear, and uh, yes, it is possible that once we obtain this uh, phenotype annotations, we can divide the patients into different subgroups, and you can use any types of post hoc interpretability approach to find the driving factors that uh, tell the different that differentiate one patient subgroup to another. And they may tell you something. Uh, they uh, may give you something more about the interpretability uh, information about these cluster assignments. Thanks. Perfect. Fantastic. Thanks, Yucha, for answering the question. And thanks, Jean Baptiste, for your question. Um, does, are there any other questions from anyone else? Um, in the audience, ah, uh, Nic Nicholas, uh, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? I think this is for Alan. Thank you. Um, so, usually, batch normalization and any type of like dropout or regularizer are very easy, easy to use. So, how difficult is to put it like tangos into a into a, a let's say a, my model that is compared. Uh, that could be a transformer, a convolutional neural networks, or or a recurrent neural network. I know I don't know. So what, what are the the technical difficulties to? Yeah, yeah. So for um for any kind of standard architecture, it should be fairly drop in. Um, <clears throat> we have an implementation on our GitHub which is just like a a Python notebook for for just getting up and started with it. Um, so that should be fairly straightforward. But I do I think um maybe more custom architectures, you might want to look at uh, re-implementation. And then there's also efficiency trade-offs. So uh, uh, as I kind of mentioned, there's um, a subsampling scheme involved. So I think um, improving the, the efficiency of the method in general is a pretty pretty interesting direction. Um, but, but for just getting up and started and doing some prototyping, uh, I just go to the GitHub uh, look at the the Python notebook we have set up there for getting started, and and the implementation there is just drop in for most networks. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. I'll be talking to, today about a, a new paper that we wrote uh, and published at AI Stats, which is about membership inference tests against synthetic data, um, and it's a, this is a uh, was a work with Hao uh, and Xiaoxi um, and Lesjips jump right into it. So let's first start with a little bit about synthetic data and, and people might have uh, already seen this, this slide in a previous um, presentation. Um, um, yeah, so what's the problem with healthcare data? Well, the problem is that often we can't actually share directly um, because data is private, um, but in the end the, oh, second, um, because there's strict regulations around data access, um, and of course, it's it's totally fair that there are these regulations, um, but in the end, this actually impedes machine learning research and um, just research in general in healthcare. Um, so a solution for this is synthetic data. Um, other people have looked at de-identified data in the past, but de-identified data is actually um, has some disadvantages. So what is de-identified data? De-identified data is data where there's personal identifiers that are removed or fields that are scrambled. So this is the, the traditional way of doing it. Uh, synthetic data, on the other hand, is entirely created from scratch. So theoretically, it cannot be really uh, synced back to any individual or individual data point. To actually, of course, generate synthetic data, you actually require machine learning. So we use deep generative models um, that you might have seen, like, for example, DALI is like an image model, but you can create similar models for um, healthcare data. Um, but to, so to create synthetic data, uh, you actually need machine learning, um, and and so it becomes a little bit of a uh, uh, circular thing. Okay, I'm seeing a question already. Oh, um, I'll just continue for now. So what are we looking at? Um, th the problem is that even though we can generate synthetic data with generative models, synthetic data is not by default private, and um, additionally, privacy metrics are actually non-intuitive. So for example, people might have heard of differential privacy, but differential privacy 
is a very difficult um, theoretical concept to understand and actually doesn't tell you much about how private is this data in practice or how vulnerable is the data to attacks. Um, so what is the, the, the aim of our research? The aim is to develop better and more realistic attacker models to understand and quantify synthetic data um, privacy vulnerability. So this might, might seem slightly counterintuitive that we are trying to actually uh, develop attacker models, but if we can't actually understand what the vulnerability is, then how are we going to solve this? Um, so we focus on one specific type of attack, and that's called membership inference attacks. Um, the actual problem formalism is slightly theoretical. Um, but essentially what, what we are trying to do is we've got a synthetic data set um, and that synthetic data set was generated by a generative model. And we want to find out whether if we have a new data set that we see, whether this was used for training of the generative model. So whether the, the point that we see is a member of the generative models training set. And the only thing that we assume here is that we see the synthetic data generated by the generative model. So a little bit uh, theoretical, but this is a very popular attack. Um, and why is it very popular? Because uh, membership to a data set reveals information. So for example, if we can infer whether someone was used for training a generative model uh, that generates, for example, patients with cancer, then that discloses that this person has cancer. Um, similarly, membership knowledge enables other attacks. So it's a little bit of a gateway attack um, and, and generally considered the easiest attack. So what is our idea? Um, our idea is to detect overfitting in the generative model. Um, and specifically, we are trying to estimate the generated density and comparing this to a real data that sets density. Um, so, so that makes quite a lot of sense if you know something about how machine learning models are trained. Often what you are trying to do is fit the, the data but you expect that whatever model you are trying to fit, that it overfits a little bit to the training data. So that around the training data, a generative model is slightly more likely to actually generate the data point. So the density will be higher. So if we can find where the little peaks are in data density, in the generated, generated density, then we know where it is likely that these models have been trained. Uh, have, well, what kind of data they have seen. So um, our solution is, is called DOMIAS, uh, stands for Detecting Overfitting for Membership Inference Attacks Against Synthetic Data. Um, we additionally assume an independent reference set, which is essentially a, a set of real examples. Um, and what we do is then we take uh, as the attacker score, we take um, the attack score proportional to the generated distribution that we have estimated over the real distribution that we have estimated. Uh, and we actually use deep flow based uh, generative models for actually uh, estimating these two different densities. Um, and the nice thing about this representation is that, that it actually is independent of the uh, data representation that we use. And what, what do I mean with that? For example, if we look at this, this super simple toy example, where we have one curve, which is PR, this is the real data de density. And then we have PG, which is the um, generator's density. We see that there's a little bump at four. Um, so in this case, it is likely that if we see a point A, that this point A was used for training of the generator because uh, maybe the generator overfitted A. Um, and similarly, if we actually change this scale, so if we, for example, take a logarithmic transform of the x-axis, then we see we still select A because the actual, um, the actual ratio between the two distributions uh, hasn't changed. So it's independent of the data representation. That is something that other people have not done in the past. Um, what are the key results? Um, well, for one, we, we vastly outperform baselines, where baselines are other attack models. So we really show across different scales, and, and um, here the scales are for the number of training steps and the number of uh, training samples. Uh, we show that the privacy risk of synthetic data is higher than reported in other work. So where other work is essentially saying, well, we can't really attack well at all. Um, we actually find that in some scenarios we can do very well and uh, definitely much better than others. Um, most importantly, I think we actually show that underrepresented groups are most vulnerable to privacy attacks. So um, we, here we display the, um, the performance on the majority and, and minority groups. 
and we see that we actually do quite a lot better, whereas other people um, often do worse. And this is, of course, a huge problem um, because actually these these uh, outliers, essentially, so minority groups, are um, perhaps already more vulnerable, and then they're also more vulnerable to privacy attacks themselves. Um, it's also not really unexpected because if you're an outlier, then the generative model is more likely to reveal something about you than if you are uh, not an outlier at all. Um, but it's nice to be seated in the result. Um, at last, why are we actually already, uh, why are we um, creating these attacker models? Well, because we actually want to evaluate our synthetic data and we want to make sure that people actually generate safer synthetic data. And we show that um, domains can be used for evaluation and selection of generative models. Um, often what people report is that there's a privacy quality trade-off. So in this figure, we, we um, on the y-axis, we have the attacker performance, which of course we want to be as low as possible. And on the x-axis, we want the uh, quality, where in this particular metric is also lower the pattern. Um, so here we see that some methods are actually not very, um, not very good if you want a good balance between privacy and quality. Uh, and here we might, for example, choose a private base if we want a, a very private model, or we might choose a TVI or NFLOW if we want a slightly less private model, but a slightly better quality model. So the conclusion is that synthetic data is not private by default, something that some people um, don't always realize. Um, we have proposed attacker models, uh, a specific variant of that, um, and which can be used for studying and quantifying privacy risks of synthetic data. Um, in our work, we've shown that privacy vulnerability exists in, um, in generative models that are already being used um, and that minority groups are the most vulnerable. So that's, um, that concludes my presentation. If you're interested in the synthetic data of the um, work of the lab, there's some, um, on the right, there's code for the paper and the codes. Um, which you can use to, to quantify the vulnerability of your own data set. Um, here's also some other papers. The top one is the AI sets paper that I just uh, elaborated on. The middle one is more a survey. And on the bottom, there's um, a new paper we'll be uh, presenting at IC now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Boris, um, for that great presentation. Um, I think we have a question for you from uh, Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth, do you want to unmute yourself and ask Boris your question? Uh, yes. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, hi, Boris. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great. So my question is, if um, your method detects overfitting, did you also experiment with how the identification of training samples of like these individual training samples changes uh, from epoch to epoch uh, during training? Because I expect overfitting to occur later yeah. in training and then to prevent overfitting. Is it enough to just stop the training process earlier um, yeah, that's or a, that's do we a, need to do something else? Yeah, that's a great question. So actually that's in this, um, in this figure. I didn't elaborate much on it, but here on the left one, you see actually that's the further we um, we go with generation, um, the more vulnerable we become. And that's because, of course, like you say, we are overfitting more. Uh, but that doesn't really mean that we should just stop earlier because we might actually, in some cases, maybe the quality will not be good enough. So in, in all cases, there's this trade-off between privacy and utility or quality that's quite hard to navigate. And... Um, like I showed in the, the later results, in this results, it's definitely important. You could, for example, make a similar curve where you have uh, one model, but you train the number, you change the number of training epochs. And then you will probably also see that the quality might go up, but the vulnerability will also go up. Um, so you can use Domia definitely to, to choose when to stop and find a good balance. Does that answer your question? Actually, can I ask a question on this graph here? That's a very interesting graph. Sorry about that. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Let me just... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, you can always start with your question. I'll just... Oh, yeah, I just wanted to ask what uh, what was exactly the additive noise uh, here? And then oh, yeah. why 
like it just looks slightly counterintuitive that Patagon, which is you know have like good uh, privacy scheme, is kind of less private than Citigun that doesn't have any pri privacy protections there. Yeah, no, good question. Um, so let's start with the first question. Additive noise is um, is essentially just taking the real data and adding a little bit of noise to it, which uh -huh. is not uncommon in the anonymization literature, where people say, well, actually. Um, to avoid, for example, linkage, adding a little bit of noise is actually um, a way to anonymize. Uh, we use it as a baseline. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little bit naive, but it's, um, it actually does quite well. Uh, it's not really a generative model, of course, but it's, um, um, you could regard it like that. Um, why Patagon does worse? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I think um, in the end, Another conclusion that you could draw from, from our work and also previous works on privacy attacks that actually privacy attacks are very hard. So here, even though Patagon is slightly less private, um, it's still quite private, right? Additionally, Patagon has a parameter that we tune. I don't know which one we, um, we chose here, but Patagon is an epsilon uh, delta differential privacy metric uh, method. So, um, it depends a little bit on how you choose epsilon. So you could definitely choose epsilon uh, in a different way and then it will be more private, but the quality will go down further. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, thanks so much. I think we have time for one final question. And I think this is a question for Alicia from uh, Tennyson. Tennyson, would you like to unmute and ask Alicia your question? Yeah, yeah. So I thought Alicia, your work was super interesting and you identified some pretty interesting challenges in heterogeneous treatment effects estimation. I was just wondering if you can, if you had any ideas or solutions on how to address them in the future. Yeah, so thank you, Tanzan. Um, as I was saying at like the end of my presentation, um, the we actually focused mainly on identifying the challenges and not so much on the solutions in the paper itself. Uh, so what we did was very naive, just like standard importance weighting. Um, I think because both the literatures on treatment effect estimation and survival analysis actually have grown quite a bit recently, um, I think there's lots of interesting things that could be adapted. Um, so on the one hand, I think on the side of the treatment effect estimation side, um, I think what would be interesting is to look at schemes that um, and combine something uh, the weighting with balancing representations. Um, so by, by learning kind of representations that mitigate some of these covariate shifts, um, it's actually not as easy as the standard treatment effect estimation problem. In our case, we, we, we have an appendix where we discuss this a little bit um, because the um, because you actually have a different representation distribution at every single time step. So you kind of need to think about how you do that best. Um, but I think so th that's one, one thing. And then the other thing um, is what we're looking at a very static um, survival analysis problem here, where we basically just measure the covariates once. Um, but um, there's been quite some work on incorporating some kind of longitudinal structures um, for example, including um, Chanki, one of our uh, previous um, PhD students, who, who's looked at kind of then using recurrent model structures to um, include covariates that are updating over time if a patient comes and visits um, a doctor more often. Um, I think that has like as a byproduct, that's not only a bit more technically interesting, but as a byproduct, that also has the nice side effect that uh, that actually makes um the uh, identifying assumptions more credible to hold if you have because you can kind of measure more things so i think these are definitely two interesting um avenues how you could like technically still improve quite a lot a lot actually over what we've done um and we so we discussed this a little bit somewhere in the appendix of our paper thank you Tennyson. thanks yeah i'll check it out fantastic i'd just like to thank all of all four of our speakers um today again and everyone who asked um who asked questions um uh, next uh i would like to um invite uh rob uh davis uh to provide a brief update on sin city so hi everyone i just wanted to pop up at the end of today's session to give you an update on where sin city is at this um for those of you who don't know, Sin City is probably our, our biggest uh, open source collaborative 
project on synthetic data. Um, and yeah, I'll just give you a brief uh, rundown of the new features that have happened since the you know, last update that we had in one of these sessions. Um, that is, uh, we've got um, a new plugin model in Goggle, which is a, uh, a GNN based tabular gen, uh, data generator, and also CavNet support for tabular GGPM, which is basically a, an intention based model um, supporting our, uh, our first diffusion model plugin in, in, in the library. And um, we've also had a tranche of many, many smaller improvements as well, including. Uh, the addition of, of more tutorials, in particular, there's a great new tutorial on hyperparameter tuning um, and you know, improvements to the documentation, both because minor improvements. There's lots of uh, lots of things happening. Um, but also, uh, we've added a contributing markdown guide file to the repository, making it even easier for any of you or anyone else to uh, contribute to the project. Um, breaks down very easily how to set up the development environment and join in the uh, and start collaborating with us. I, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of the community collaborators we've had so far, but the names are in the, in the bottom right of that screen here. Um, yeah, and we really would like to encourage as many of you as possible who are interested in SimCity to yeah, download it, use it in your projects. If it doesn't do something you'd like it to do, submit an issue, and um, you know, we'd love to uh, to work with you to get it included. Um, which brings me on to the upcoming features and initiatives for the next month. Uh, the next thing I'll be working on is um, the adversarial random forest um, generative model, which will be SimCity's first tree-based generative model. It'll be uh, yeah, very exciting new addition to the, to the project. Um, and yeah, as I say, um, we want as many of you to join in and uh, help keep developing SimCity as possible. So contribute to the code with the new contributing markdown, which is super easy, or just message us on the uh, on the Slack channel. Um, so it should be the same Slack uh, as uh, the, uh, the one we're using today under the uh, hashtag SimCity channel. Um, but yeah, also on GitHub, create new issues, pull requests, and we'll be really, really excited to collaborate with you. So this this almost brings us to the close of today's session. Um, I just want to say if you enjoyed today's session and you have friends, colleagues, collaborators that couldn't make it and you think any one of today's talks might be of particular interest to them, today's session will be on YouTube soon and the link will be circulated. So please do send that their way. Our next inspiration exchange session uh, will be taking place on June 15th and will focus on treatment effects and machine learning for clinical trials. If somehow um, you are not signed up for today's session, but yet you've made your way here, please do visit our dedicated page for inspiration exchange and follow um, the instructions there for how to sign up so you don't miss out on any um, news or updates on Inspiration Exchange. And please do let your friends and colleagues know about this as well so that they can sign up. Finally, I just wanna say a big thank you once again to all of our speakers, anyone who answers questions and also everyone for attending today. So thank you very much. And I hope to see you all next time. Thanks. <laughs>